Greetings, St. Barnabas. So it's nice to be with you again, with you in this way, uh, for another reflection on the Lord's Prayer. I, I am um, kind of acutely aware that uh, we've said a lot about the Lord's Prayer, and I think I said that in the previous reflection, so it's, it's kind of weighing on me that there's a lot here. And, and again, I may have said this earlier as well, but, but it's in me to say it again. I really see the Lord's Prayer as a roadmap for the spiritual journey or a guidebook for the spiritual journey. I see it as, as a, a way of, uh, a guidance for a way of being in relationship with God and being God's partner in the world that starts, it's so profound that it meets us wherever we are and begins to engage us and then take us deeper and deeper and deeper. And so it's, I think it's why it just has, has endured the test of 2,000 years in being in all the liturgies of the Episcopal Church and many other traditions. It's just such a profound gift to us. So I hope you're you can hang in there with this and be patient as we, as we go a little bit at a time and, and explore the themes. And um, uh, soon, I hope, I hope that I'll have an opportunity to try to put, put it together a bit for, for all of us to um, see how all the parts connect. And in the meantime, I, I do hope that, that what we've said about about entering into in, in, entering into relationship with with the God who Jesus describes or and calls Abba, and then the first three petitions that pull us out of an over attachment to what the tradition calls our self made self or our false self or what Saint Paul calls the old man. That focusing on God in the first three petitions pulls us out of an over investment there and then and then leads to the fourth petition the request for the super substantial bread of the spirit and as we begin to to pray that prayer we realize that that this that that focusing on god and and hallowing the name and bringing the kingdom and and being a part of the affecting of the will of god in the earth has been opening us to the presence of the spirit deep within the super substantial food, and then and then to begin to pray for it, just names that and opens it deeply. And, and then I focused on the themes of the fruits of the Spirit that begin to emerge within us and, and the profound gift of realizing the character of God is already in me and, and opening myself to that character starts to make such a big difference. And that, as that makes makes headway and as again as we as we make headway in freedom from distress and anxiety and again just over worrying about our life we discover um, our giftedness and energy around our gifts and how the gifts propel us to be God's partner and to be disciples of Jesus and then we come to the fifth petition which I've reflected on the last two reflections, and I want to say more about in, in this reflection, the petition to forgive and, and how I, I've suggested that this petition may actually be, be what is everything that we would learn to forgive. And if not everything, at least at the heart of everything. And there's several reasons for that, which I've already talked a little bit about, but I want to say again, the, the invitation to us or the call to us or the demand to us to forgive becomes transformative in ways we never even imagined. As we begin to engage that, it, it changes us. And so um, previously I, I focused on the wisdom sayings of Jesus that the, the Father sends the rain on the, the unrighteous and the righteous. The Father causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. And those are metaphors 
for how the goodness of God falls upon all. And Jesus invites us, hit the pause button and come to terms with this. Be children of your heavenly Father. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, that ought to impale us. I mean, it's such a dramatic statement for Jesus to make. It, it throws us on the mercy of God. I don't know how to let my goodness fall upon everyone the way you do, Father, or the way Jesus describes you do in this. I don't know how to love them as you love them. And so again, I'm thrown back to those first three petitions. And I, I said that, I know I said that in the previous reflection. I, I'm not going to say it again. Instead, I want to go back to this statement of Jesus after the Lord's Prayer. His commentary on the prayer is only about forgiveness. If you forgive the trespasses of others, your Heavenly Father will forgive your trespasses. If you don't forgive the trespasses of others, your Heavenly Father will not forgive your trespasses or sins, as however we might understand that, or debts. And so I want to say more about that. I don't think Jesus is saying God is sitting on a bench waiting to judge us. In fact, I think he's saying something dramatically different than that. I don't think he's saying we're going to, you know, sometime in the resurrection, God is going to be on a bench and looking at us and saying, nope, you didn't forgive, you're not forgiven. Adios. I don't think that's what's happening here. I think Jesus is saying something far more natural and innate and integral to the human situation. So later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will say, judge not, lest you be judged. And then, by the measure or by the judgment you judge, you will be judged. By the measure you measure, you will be measured. And so, if I pull out the measuring stick upon you, I pull it out upon myself. And if you don't measure up, then I don't measure up. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, if you forgive the transgressions of others, you'll be forgiven. If you don't forgive them, you won't be. And we all, we all, want the measuring stick of God upon us to be abundantly merciful and gracious. And if that's what we want for ourselves, then that's what we must offer to others. And so, I, again, I talked in the previous meditation about, about finding the larger self within ourselves. And, and I think I referenced it as the divine self. And the tradition also calls it, just talks about the divine indwelling and talks about the indwelling Holy Spirit and talks about our true self. St. Paul talks about the new self in Christ. And, and all of that is available to us. It wants to grow in us. And again, that's where the fruits of the Spirit begin to emerge in us. And so um, there's a helpful... Uh, um, teaching of Evagrius Ponticus. Evagrius said, it's not okay to be annoyed by another human being. Now, again, you just kind of want to pause for a moment and say, oh, wait a minute, there's people that are annoying to me. There's people that are annoying. And whenever I come to this, I'm reminded of an incident between my wife Betsy and I. Uh, there was a person in our former church that just just drove me insane and uh, annoyed the bejeebers out of me. And one day I was talking with Betsy about this, and Betsy says, oh my gosh, that's the most entertaining person in the church. How in the world do you see those idiosyncrasies as, an, as annoying? I, I think they're incredibly fun. And, and it just gave me a whole different way of thinking about this person. And then it was around that time I came across Thomas Keating's teaching and when he said, in which he said, God will always send annoying people into your life because they're there for your own transformation. 
And in my reflection upon love, upon both of those things, I realized that if somebody annoys me, that's about me, not them. It's about my measuring stick. That's about my judgments. And little by little, that grew in me and grew in me. And I'm, by the way, don't hear me say I finished the journey and never have an annoying person. However, it has invited me to learn to welcome the annoying person, to celebrate, because they're there to show me my judgments and my measuring stick and my small self, not my large self, not the self that is like God, not the divine self within me that loves every human being, celebrates every human being, finds joy and fun and charm in every human being. And again, the great gift of this is that as it transforms us, as it opens us to our divine self, the self that is full of grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy and a boundless, endless love, it gives us the power. That there's a great Greek word for that. The word enables us, empowers us to also forgive our offenders, to also forgive those who have treated us unjustly and placed the greatest wounds in us, to also forgive those who have committed heinous crimes on humanity, to forgive the injustice, the generational injustices of the world that just impale us and embitter us and shrink us. We find the energy to see even those things differently, to see deeply into everything, to see the goodness in everything, little by little, to see, relate, and respond to everything and everyone with seeing the divine presence in them in, through, and beyond everything and everyone and every circumstance to see the divine presence, the goodness of God at work in everyone and everything in every circumstance. And as we do, our gifts are set free. The giftedness of you becomes set free to make a difference, to bring peace and reconciliation in everything. So, more to come. Peace to you. Amen.